On behalf of uh, Cardiovascular Research on Life, we have an honor today to host uh, Professor Salim Yusuf, uh, Director of uh, Public Health Research uh, Institute and creator of this institute, a person that has uh, uh, revolutionized, I can, can say openly, uh, clinical research uh, for a number of years uh, uh, now. Uh, but for us, uh, particularly importantly, uh, Senior uh, Advising uh, Editor of uh, Cardiovascular Research, for which we are grateful to you, uh, Salim very much. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Yeah. Salim, uh, a person of such achievement uh, is the best person to ask. What is the secret of success in science? Is it uh, uh, ambition or is it talent? Well, I wouldn't put either of them as the top thing. You know, you need many, many things. But the most important thing is to ask important questions that make a difference to people and then take the long journey. It takes a long time to answer those questions uh, and so put the effort in uh, to make it happen. And important questions take a minimum of a decade to answer from thinking of the idea, designing the study, running it and analyzing it, sometimes even longer. So. I would actually say get the big picture right, but get the details right, and then very work very hard to make it happen. And, uh, you know, I asked the same question to Sir Richard Peter once. Mm. How do you know that the question is important? Well, there, there are different ways that you try to make an assessment. Uh, if something is more common, it's likely to be more important than something less common because of the human health impact. If you're trying to make a difference to people's lives, obviously dying or living or having a heart attack or a stroke versus not having that is more important than changing blood pressure or glucose or lipids. So it's what you try to change in how many people would be affected makes it more important. Sometimes uh, something is very important even when it doesn't do either of these and it could be a fundamental conceptual change that would be very important as well so there are different kinds of questions and uh, often people can make up their own minds what is important and uh, uh, you've addressed a lot of very important questions throughout the years. Uh, can you try to identify which of the questions you asked uh, made the biggest difference, uh, finding the answer to well, it? Well, doing the large simple trials in acute infarction with beta blockers and uh, thrombolytics and aspirin in the ISIS trials made a big difference. Uh, but the key thing is that it changed the culture. It brought hundreds of thousands of investigators together working together to answer important questions. In, when I moved to the US, the SOLVE studies were important. They were the first major trials that showed you could actually change the course of heart failure. When I came to McMaster, our studies which hope uh, showing ACE inhibitors worked in people without heart failure were important, or dual antiplatelet therapy with cure, or the interheart study, which was the first study looking at the effect of risk factors in different parts of the world, and now the PURE study. And so there are different studies, they're all important. But if you ask me, what am I most proud of? I'm most proud of is developing a global collaboration through global friendships uh, and addressing important questions uh, with a team and building global capacity to do good research. So, you know, I have had an honor to collaborate with you, and I have to say that, you know, all of the investigators that work with you feel proud to, uh, to have this opportunity. And the question is, how do you do this? How do you, uh, how do you, how are you able to excite uh, this uh, uh, sort of devotion in, uh, in as you said, uh, hundreds, and I would say even maybe thousands of people all around the world, that, uh, that you are able to sort of infect them with your enthusiasm for the question. I think this is a, a difficulty sometimes. Well, thank you. I mean, I think, uh, I, I think it relates to the fact that we always try to do important studies that ha make a difference to people living or dying or the human health. So others recognize that they have an opportunity to work with a team 
to address it. The second thing you do is you make friends with people. So that I've always said you have to have friends to do re collaborative research. It doesn't work the other way around. You don't first create a network and make friends. You make friends and create a network. So when that happens, there will always be, in the course of these studies, challenges. Some you anticipate, some you don't. And uh, in order to overcome them, you need to have a good friendship with people so that you can uh, seek their help. Um, and cooperation in answering them. So our collaborative work is not a matter of getting a bunch of money centrally and handing it over. It's actually sometimes even raising money together. Uh, like in the Pew study, every country that's participated raised money. So it, it, it's that collaborative, cooperative, friendly approach on important questions. And I, I must say, I don't go out of my way to keep people happy, I just try to do the right thing. And hopefully uh, they see that the goals are good, the approach is fair, and so they remain friends. Well, the fruit of your uh, efforts show that they, this is a good approach. Uh, you mentioned pure study. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, uh, and it has been for uh, a number of years now, changing our view of cardiovascular prevention, of uh, cardiovascular uh, uh, risk. Uh, uh, could you tell us how you came up with, what, what question led to, uh, to creation of such a, a large effort? Because, you know, to maintain it is, uh, is an enormous effort that uh, maybe not everybody appreciates. Well, the idea for, for PURE was born in the late 90s, although some, some kernels existed even before that. It came out of the inter-heart study, as the inter-heart study was happening, when we realized that the risk factors more or less behave the same worldwide. So the next question we asked is, uh, is it risk factors that explain the differences between different countries and different societies? And our thinking was that it was urbanization and in increasing development that led to more risk factors and therefore most cardiovascular disease. And indeed we found that urbanization and richer countries had higher risk factors compared to poorer countries or people living in rural areas. But we found that cardiovascular disease and mortality did not track with it. In fact, if anything, although the rich countries had more risk factors, they had less cardiovascular disease. This then brought in the concept of the importance of health systems. We're now looking at things like frailty, and we think frailty is a big issue. It's more common in poor countries and less common in rich countries. And frailty may be a marker of vulnerability to dying when somebody gets a problem. So I think the concepts have to evolve in that risk factors alone is not responsible for uh, disease or death. It, it's the importance of the health systems as well as uh, uh, other factors like frailty. We're also looking at societal factors because we felt we had to characterize societies, so we characterize communities. And that does have an effect, but it's not as big as we thought it was. Hmm. And uh, if we think uh, about the current most, I mean, you've already mentioned the frailty, which uh, indeed uh, many people, uh, but it's interesting because it's actually in developed countries that we are paying particular attention to frailty right. now. Right. But uh, what other aspects of, uh, uh, of, of cardiovascular biology and uh, cardiovascular epidemiology uh, are now the main uh, uh, topic in, in the PURE study? I think uh, understanding health systems is very important because the use of proven, simple proven therapies like antiplatelet agents, um, statins, uh, getting people to stop smoking, healthy diets is very, very low. So practically every proven therapy, even in rich countries, you hit a ceiling around 40 or 50 percent. So it's not just a matter of telling people what to do or having the evidence. There are barriers that you need to overcome. So understanding those barriers at a societal level, at a health systems level, at an individual level becomes very important. I believe the next decade is not going to be the decade or next 20 years. is not a decade where health is primarily improved by personalized medicine. It's going to be improved by understanding why we cannot translate what we already know into practice. And we need it at three levels. We need it at the society level, at the health systems level and the individual level. Yeah. You know, as uh, 
Journal of Basic and Translational Medicine, we focus quite a lot on discovery and translation of the discovery into the clinical study. But uh, you are bringing up a very important point that uh, translation in medicine actually ends with implementation of the discovery uh, towards the end. Well, the goal should be yeah. to translate what we know in clinical medicine and in populations as widely as would as possible and obviously in appropriate people and appropriate populations. So evidence-based medicine is great, but evidence-based medicine needs to be implemented and that's where it has to go. And I believe in the next two decades we will save more lives by implementing what we know than discovering new risk factors or new pathways or new drugs. Not that we shouldn't do it, that's important, but let's implement what we know. What do you think uh, are actually barriers for development of cardiovascular uh, medicine and cardiovascular research now? Many people are saying that, you know, the pharmaceutical industry is no longer that interested in developing new therapies in cardiovascular uh, field. What is the, the, the reason for that? Uh, cardiovascular uh, disease is the number one killer of uh, the disease uh, of, uh, if, uh, in the world, right? Well, cardiovascular disease is still the number one killer of uh, at least a uh, uh, cause of premature deaths worldwide. But the disease has shifted. It has shifted from younger people to older people. It has shifted from richer people to not so rich people. It shifted from rich countries to poorer countries. In some of the rich countries today, cancer is more common as a cause of death than heart disease. Canada is an example of that. I think we're going to start to see a a transition from one type of non-communicable disease, cardiovascular, going down to other forms going up, like cancers. So since the investment of the pharmaceutical companies almost always is in regions of the world where they can generate a reasonable return on investment, they are going to invest in the diseases that are more common in the rich countries. And because cardiovascular disease is coming down, and the other diseases um, are, 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 are needing attention. That's where they're investing. Having said that, there are still companies investing in cardiovascular disease uh, and new pathways to prevent from clotting, new pathways for blood pressure lowering, new pathways for uh, reducing cholesterol. So uh, it's not to say uh, it's come to a standstill, but certainly it's new like drug disease due drug yeah. work is being done in diseases outside cardiovascular disease. Having said that, we've made so much advances in cardiovascular disease that as a, as a society, we need to make advances in other common diseases as well. So it's not inappropriate to have a shift. And again, when we have this large body of evidence that we're not putting into practice fully, surely that's gotta be a priority. So we shouldn't think of research in cardiovascular disease being entirely pharmacologically oriented, it's got to be, you know, health systems, structural, social, um, you know, those are the things that we have to look at as well. So in what's the, the future for yeah. Salim uh, Yusuf? What's, yeah. what's your um, next ambition? Well, now my next ambition is really to promote research, keep on promoting research worldwide, build capacity to help and mentor younger people in our group. Uh, when I say our group, I don't mean just in Hamilton, but around the world that we collaborate with to help them um, answer big questions by empowering them, hopefully helping them overcome problems. And hopefully they see in me uh, something that they can use to emulate me. I'd like the next generation to do better than me. Doing the same as me is not good enough. So, uh, and I think there are a lot of wonderful people out there who are truly committed, and I've been fortunate to work with so many of them. I won't mention names because there are so many of them, many here, but many around the world. I must say that in a recent interview with Barbara Cassaday, the president of the European Cardiac Society, she pointed to sort of global health uh, right. intervention as one of the top aims of European Cardiac Society. Where do you feel, as a uh, former and current leader of the World Health Federation, uh, is the best place for convergence of these two uh, uh, institutions and societies? I think. Um, 
um, there's already a good convergence between the two. The European society uh, is a partner of, um, of the World Heart Federation, as is the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, and several other uh, mid-sized um, national foundations like the British Heart Foundation or the Canadian Heart and Stroke Foundation and a few others. So that convergence is coming. Um, the World Heart Federation is really quite a modest organization. It doesn't have huge resources. So it has to work through member state organizations. And there are about 190 organizations that are member of uh, World Heart Federation. And I see our role in empowering these people to do the right thing in their own country. The World Heart Federation does not have the resources or the manpower, but it does have the vision. And I think the AHA, the ESC, the ACC, the three big groups, Japan is important, China is important, India is important, but hasn't organized itself, uh, along with the UK, Canada, and a few others. I mean, many in Europe are not part of the um, World Heart Federation, like France or Germany. They ought to be. Um, these are important countries that can make a difference. The Scandinavian countries are part of it, but could do more. So I think creating a coalition, a global coalition, of key societies and foundations around the world uh, will be critical. And I'm really pleased that Barbara Cassidy has highlighted global efforts as one of our priorities. So uh, uh, returning to maybe more personal uh, right. touch, what uh, is your plan, uh, uh, your personal plan uh, in the nearest future? Uh, I think if you now ask me, I would say my personal plan is to catch up on certain things in life that I have not paid enough attention to. And in that, the most important thing is family. I want to spend more time with my family, with my wife and children, and now I have three grandchildren, and, and to spend more time with them uh, than I did in the past. This doesn't mean that work still won't be important, but it's not as important as it was 10 years back or 20 years back. So that's my personal goal and continue to, uh, to work in science and help a lot of young people be succeed, successful. Um, my personal ambition is to continue the path of discovery. Um, and I think the best way I can do it is to have a multiplier effect by helping other people to be successful and then the effect will, will, will be much bigger. Uh, on behalf of Cardiovascular Research on Life, uh, we are very grateful that uh, you uh, have joined us today for this, uh, uh, for this uh, conversation in the uh, series uh, in conversation with leaders of uh, cardiovascular research. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.